Ephesians chapter 3. And I've titled today's message, God's Marvelous Secret. God's Marvelous Secret. Now, in the second half of Ephesians chapter 2 that we covered last week, we see that Paul painted a vivid contrast between uh, the double alienation of the Gentiles that uh, endured before Christ and their double reconciliation through Christ. For by his death, Christ demolished the Jew Gentile man barriers and is now creating in relation to himself a single, a single new multicultural human society, which is both the family God loves and the temple he lives in. This, of course, church is the church, not just this church, but the universal church, all true believers, everyone that has truly accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, the worldwide body of born-again believers. And so after having discussed the union between Jewish and Gentile believers in the church at the end of chapter 2, it appears now that Paul is about to offer a prayer in behalf of these believers. But as we're about to see, he puts a stop to it. He stops mid-sentence and shifts. And we'll digress, digress on the subject of the mystery of Christ. Wonderful, marvelous, or God's wonderful, marvelous secret. And so in the section that we're going to be covering today, that we're going to be going over, Paul will be explaining this mystery and his responsibility to dispense it. And so our task this morning as we approach Ephesians chapter 3 will be to discover what this mystery is, what this marvelous mystery is, and how it affects the life of the Apostle Paul. From this, we will gain insight into the way in which this mystery also relates to our own lives. So before I begin the first part of our reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, as as Pastor Isaac mentioned, Lord, as he prayed, we are thankful that you brought us here. And so now, Lord, I pray that you will continue to shower, shower us with your blessings. Lord, pray that you will give us the wisdom that we so desperately need. You will give us insight into, these, into this marvelous secret, that your marvelous secret that you've, been, that you've given us through Jesus. Help us to see what it is that you want to tell us, Lord, and maybe grow from it. And we just use that wisdom again to share the good news of Jesus Christ to those near and far. So bless everyone here that's listening. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. May we just glorify you in this time. So pray for those watching and listening that you may speak to them powerfully as well, Lord. That more people will come to your saving saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, Lord. So again, bless this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, you have heard, haven't you? about the administration of God's grace that he gave to me for you. 
mystery was all writ- was made known to me by revelation as I have briefly written above. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. I was made a servant of this gospel gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of His power. It should be obviously clear that that the first three letters or the first three words of this chapter for this reason is directly related to what he just said in chapter 2. As I mentioned earlier, it seems as though Paul was on the verge of praying for the Gentile believers, but was somehow reminded of his status as a prisoner. Not only as a prisoner for Christ, but also a prisoner for his Gentile readers, his Gentile readers or believers, because we find the same expression for this reason in verse 14. But before, again, as I mentioned, before he starts that prayer, he stops. He suddenly stops. Now, it's quite possible, and this is what I imagine in my mind, that he was about to write his prayer. As he was about to write his prayer, he may have moved his hand and noticed the shackles, the chains that were around his wrists. Perhaps they were clinking as Paul's hands moved from his little ink supply to his parchment, or even the links of his chain possibly got tangled up and he wasn't able to move far, move his hands. Nevertheless, Paul was somehow reminded of his status as prisoner, not only as a prisoner for Christ, but also a prisoner for his Gentile believe, or readers. And we know from Acts chapter 21 that the Jews had claimed he was distorting God's message. So consequently, they were instrumental in obtaining his imprisonment in Jerusalem. Later in Acts chapter 24 and 27, we're told he was taken to Caesarea, <coughs> tried and granted an appeal to Caesar which resulted in his imprisonment in Rome. Thus, his Roman incarceration was the result of his mission to the Gentiles. Now, as a side note, I, I, I really hate to say it, but I'm glad that Paul was in prison. Well, if you're wondering what I mean by that, let me explain. I'm glad Paul was in prison because our Bible is a whole lot richer and the body much more complete as a result. You see, while he was in prison, Paul wrote the letters that we value so greatly. In addition, the guards to whom he was chained as prisoner began getting saved one by one, returning to Caesar's palace as born-again believers. That's why in his letter to to the Philippians, Paul says, the saints in Caesar's palace, your new brothers in Christ, greet you. Now, I read somewhere that Happy will be the one who realizes that whenever, wherever he is, has been ordained by the Lord to bring about good things if he will have eyes to see and patience to wait. So in other words, the Lord has you all where you are for a reason and purpose. 
He has you here in this church for a reason and purpose. I didn't know it at the time, but in 2006, the Lord brought me and my family to El Paso. Yeah, I mean, I, but I could easily say my work brought me here and all that stuff, but there was a number of locations, places in the northern border and in the southern border where they could have sent me, but he brought me here. And now, looking back, hindsight, I can see that being here in front of you all was one of the reasons he brought me here and he has us here. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's great how marvelous how God works. And so whenever I complain about my circumstances or situation, what I'm really doing is complaining about my father. Not my earthly father, my heavenly father. For it's he who sets our course and determines our days. Paul never lost this perspective. That's why he could say, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for it is he who has captivated my heart and brought me to this place. So as I said before, he writes down his prayer. But uh, Before he writes down his prayer, Paul breaks off at the end of verse 1 and begins one new long sentence that ended in verse 13. Now let me reread to you verse 2 using the New King James Version. There it says, if, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace, of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now, I mention that, I read that version because the word administration has the sense of stewardship or a trust to be dispensed. Paul was to administer God's grace, which was given to him. And he will elaborate on this, or he did elaborate on this in verses 3 to 6. The grace was given to him to dispense to the Gentiles at Ephesus. That's what he meant for you. Because he was an apostle to the Gentiles. See, God gave him a dispensation, a stewardship, that he might go to the Gentiles, not only with the good news of salvation through Christ, but also with the message that the Jews and the Gentiles were now one in Christ. So in verse 3 to 5, Paul goes on to speak of a mystery, of a mystery which has been made known. A marvelous mystery previously hidden to men in other generations. But now that mystery is now revealed to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. God's purpose, hidden but now revealed, the mystery of Christ is this is that God has created a church in Christ, made up of those who were alienated, Jew and Gentile, and now made into a new entity, a new entity, entity that we call the church. This revelation this revelation that Paul received took place on a Damascus, on the road to Damascus. And this revelation, that trip to Damascus, turned Paul's life completely upside down. The revelation of Christ in him 
necessitated a radical rethinking of what the Old Testament really meant and how it was fulfilled in Christ. The result of which was the gospel given to and preached by Paul. Paul, when he got it, he was blown away because it went against everything that he learned, everything that he was taught, his training, all the books, parchments that he had. It went against everything, his learning, everything about his learning and everything he had previously based his life upon. Paul adds in verse 7 that the mystery not only gives believing Gentiles a new relationship, but also reveals that there is a new power, a new power available to them. This power is illustrated in the life of Paul. See, God saved him by grace and gave him a stewardship, a special ministry to the Gentiles. God also gave Paul the power to accomplish this ministry. The word working there is ener energia in Greek, from which we get the word energy. The word power, <coughs> excuse me, the word power is dunamis, which gives us our words dynamic and dynamite. Now, ministering this grace by God's strength, not his own, was Paul's responsibility, though he considered himself the least, the least of all the saints. Friends, this wasn't false modesty, but true humility. Elsewhere, Paul called himself the foremost of sinners and not worthy of God's salvation. You see, he never forgot that in the past, in the life he once lived prior to Christ, he had blasphemed and persecuted Christ, had persecuted Christ and persecuted the church. He was there during the martyrdom of Stephen and also the arrest and imprisonment and execution of many Christians at that time. He hated them. He hated believers. So he went against everything that he was taught. Yet God Yet God, in His grace, chose Paul as His minister. He chose you as well. This should make you just praise, humble you, and praise God at the same time. See, Church, understanding the deep truths of God's word, it doesn't give man a big head. It gives him a broken and contrite heart. I'm going to continue on with what I'm saying here and, and further elaborate, but uh, I want to move on to the next part of our reading and, and then discuss it a little bit more. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. God's word says, this grace was given to me, the least of all saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable rich riches of Christ and to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known to the church 
to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. This is according to His eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. So then I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. So Paul tells us here that his mystery is twofold. It concerned the gospel and it concerned the church. Now first he told men how to be saved. Then he led them into the truth of the New Testament church. See, for him, evangelism was not an end in itself, but a step toward establishing and strengthening those first New Testament churches. Now, the first function of his ministry was to preach among the Gentiles the immeasurably immeasurable riches in verse 7. But here he describes them as incalculable. Those words can be translated untraceable, which means that they're so vast, they're so huge, it's so much that there's simply no way to discover the end. Brother and sister, when a person trusts the Lord Jesus, he immediately becomes a spiritual billionaire. You become a spiritual billionaire. In Christ, you you possess inexhaustible treasures. The second part of Paul's ministry was to make them all see what is the administration, what is the administration of the mystery. In other words, to enlighten them as to how the mystery is being worked out in practice. God's plan for this present age, for the age that we live in right now, the church age is to call out the Gentiles, call out of the Gentiles, a people for His name, a bride for His Son. All that's involved in this plan is the administration of the mystery. Again, all that He mentions here, it must mean all believers Unsaved people couldn't be expected to understand the deep truths of this mystery. Paul, therefore, is referring to all in the sense of saved people of all kinds, Jews and Gentiles. Now, this mystery, from the beginning of the ages, it had been hidden in God. The plan was itself in the mind of God eternally. He always knew about it. He was aware of it. But here, the thought is that he kept a secret throughout the ages of human history. Once again, we notice the care the Holy Spirit takes to impress us with the fact that the assembly, the church, the, or the universal church is something new, something unique, something unprecedented. It was not known to anyone but God. The secret was hidden in God who created all things. He created the material universe. He created the ages. And He created the church. 
But in his wisdom, in his infinite and vast wisdom, he decided to withhold any knowledge of this new creation until Christ, his son, came. So maybe you're thinking at this point, or you're asking yourself this question, why did God keep his secret about the church hidden for so many centuries? Certainly the Old Testament clearly states that God will save the Gentiles through Israel. But nowhere, but nowhere are we told that both Jews and Gentiles will form a new creation, the church, the body of Christ. It was this mystery that the Spirit revealed to Paul and the other leaders in the early church. And that was difficult. That was hard for the Jews to accept. So Paul tells us in verse 10 that even the rulers and authorities are involved in this great secret. The rulers and authorities. God is educating the angels by, the, by means of the church. Now, by the rulers and authorities and in the heavens, Paul means the angelic beings created by God, both good and evil. Now, I'm not sure if you knew this or were aware of this, but angels are created beings and aren't omniscient. What do I mean by that? They don't possess this vast wisdom, this universal knowledge. Only God my friends, is omniscient. Angels, again, are created beings. They don't know everything. In fact, Peter indicates in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, that during the Old Testament period, the angels were curious about God's plan of salvation then being worked out on earth. Now, it's a fact that The angels rejoice when a believer, when at the repentance of a lost sinner. And Paul suggests that the angels watch the activities of the local assembly. 1 Corinthians 11.10 pretty much says that they're watching us here, this church. They're looking to see what we're going to do. How are we going to, what they're going to learn from us. And I certainly hope that since we've opened our doors here, they have learned a lot from this church. But yes, they're watching what we're doing here. How we're doing it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. And so what do the angels learn from the church? It says there in verse 3, God's multifaceted wisdom. No doubt the angels know about the power of God as seen in his creation. But the wisdom of God as seen in his creation, the church, it's something that's new to them. Something they've never seen before. What do I mean? Unsaved people, unsaved men and women, including wise philosophers, they look, they look at this plan of salvation and they consider it foolish. But the angels watch. They watch the outworking of God's salvation. You know what they do as they watch? They praise his wisdom. Paul calls it the multi 
multifaceted wisdom. And it carries the idea, idea of basically multicolored. This here, it suggests the beauty and variety of God's wisdom in his great plan of salvation. But there's another facet to this truth that must be explored. What are the evil angels learning from God's mystery? What are they learning, those evil angels? Here's the answer. That their leader, Satan himself, doesn't have any wisdom. Sure, Satan knows the Bible and he understands from the Old Testament scriptures that the Savior would come, when he would come, how he would come, and where he would come. Satan also understood why he would come as far as redemption is concerned. But nowhere in the Old Testament would Satan find any prophecies concerning the church, the mystery of Jews and Gentiles united in one body. Now, Satan could see unbelieving Jews rejecting the Messiah. He could see Gentiles trusting the Messiah, but he could not see both believing Jews and Gentiles united in one body, seated with Christ in the heavenlies and completely, completely victorious over Satan. Had Satan known the far-reaching results of the cross, excuse me, no doubt he would have altered his plans accordingly. God hid this great plan from the beginning of the world, but now he wants the mystery to be known by his church. And this is why he made Paul a steward, an administrator of this great truth. Ephesians, or verse 9, should read, and to make all men see what is the stewardship of the mystery. My friends, believers in Christ, here is an amazing truth. All believers are to be faithful stewards of this truth, of this great truth now, now, today. This sacred sacred secret, this mar marvelous secret that was so important to Paul and to the Gentiles and to angels is now in our hands. We have it. It's been given to us. In verse 11, Paul tells us that the mystery itself, its concealment, its eventual disclosure, and the manner in which it exhibits the wisdom of God are all, are all according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, before the world was made, God knew Satan would fall and man would follow him in sin. And he had already prepared a counter-strategy, a master plan. This plan has been worked out. This plan has been worked out in the incarceration, death, resurrection, ascension, and glorification of Christ. Incarnation, death, resurrection, ascension, and glorification of Christ. The entire program, the whole program centered in Christ and has been realized 
through him. So now, God can save ungodly Jews and Gentiles, make them members of the body of Christ, conform them into the image of his son, and honor them in a unique way as the bride of the Lamb throughout eternity. Verse 12, as a result of Christ's work and our union with him, we now have the unspeakable privilege, the unspeakable privilege of entering into God's presence at any time in full confidence of being heard and without any fear of being scolded. You can come to him and tell him all your needs, everything that's going on in your life. You can tell him of your joys. You can tell him of your sorrows. You can tell him of your triumphs. You can tell him of your defeats. And he will rejoice with you or he will comfort you. Our boldness is the respectful confidence attitude is the respectful attitude and absence of fear we have as children addressing their father our access is our liberty to speak to god in prayer our confidence is the assurance of a welcome a hearing and a wise and loving answer and it's all through faith in him that is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, in verse 13, in view of the dignity of his ministry and wonderful results that flowed from it, Paul encouraged the saints. Paul encouraged the believers not to be disheartened when they thought of his sufferings, when they thought of Paul's sufferings. See, he was glad to endure tribulations in carrying out his mission to the Gentiles. Rather than being discouraged by his troubles, he says, in effect, they should be proud. They should be proud he was counted worthy to suffer for the Lord Jesus. They should rejoice to think of the benefit of his tribulations to them and to other Gentiles. They should see his current imprisonment as glory and not disgrace. Most of us identify with Napoleon Bonaparte as the would-be conqueror of Europe, but not many would name him as a patron of arts and sciences. Yet he was. In July 1798, Napoleon began to occupy Egypt. But by September 1801, he was forced to get out. <coughs> Those three years meant failure as far as his military and political plans were concerned. But here's the thing. They meant success in one area greatly in one area that greatly interests him, archaeology. For in August 1799, a Frenchman named Bassand discovered the Rosetta Stone about 30 miles from Alexandria. This discovery gave to archaeologists the key understanding of Egyptian hieroglyphics. It opened the door to modern Egyptian studies. And here's what I'm getting, that, getting at with that. The mystery that, we're, that Paul is talking about here is God's Rosetta Stone. It's the key to what he promised in the Old Testament, what Christ did in the Gospels, what the early church, church did in the book of Acts, what Paul and the other writers teach in the epistles and 
what God will do as, as recorded in the book of Revelation. And so God's program today isn't the headship of Israel, but the headship of Christ over his church. We today are under a different stewardship from that of Moses and the prophets. And we must be careful not to confuse what God has clarified. Now the reason many churches are weak and ineffective is because they don't understand what they have in Christ. And the cause of this is often spiritual leaders who aren't good stewards, administrators of the mystery. Because they don't divide, rightly divide the word of truth. They confuse their people concerning their spiritual position in Christ. And they rob their people of the spiritual wealth in Christ. This great truth concerning the church isn't a divine afterthought. It's a part of God's eternal purpose in Christ. To ignore this truth is to sin against the Father who planned it, the Son whose death made it possible, and the Spirit who today seeks to work in our lives and accomplish what God has planned so when you understand this truth, it gives you great confidence and faith. When you know what God is doing in the world and you work with Him, you can be sure that He will work in you and for you. All of God's divine resources, my friends, are available to those who sincerely want to do His will and help Him accomplish His purposes on earth. The early church, those early New Testament church, churches, thought that the gospel belonged to the Jews because they had to come through them and to them first until Peter, by divine direction, went to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. The Jewish believers thought that the Gentile had to become a Jew before he could become a Christian. God's Spirit gradually revealed to the churches that God was doing a new thing. He was calling out a people for His name, from both Jew and Gentile. What does that mean? What does that mean? There are no national, racial, political, physical, or social distinctions in the church. We're all one. We're all equal. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Do you believe this, my church? I mean, church, do you believe this? We're all one in Christ Jesus. But an understanding of God's program in this present age not only gives the believer confidence, an understanding of God's program in this present age not only gives the believer confidence toward God, but it also gives him courage for the difficult circumstances of life. Paul's sufferings for the Gentiles would mean glory for the Gentiles. Back in the Old Testament age, when God's people obeyed, what happened? God blessed them materially, nationally, and physically. And if, this, and if they disobeyed, He withdrew these blessings. 
Guess what? This isn't the way he deals with the church today. He doesn't do that. Our blessings are spiritual, not material. They have, been, they, they have all been given to us completely in Christ. We appropriate them by faith. But if we disobey God, He doesn't revoke them. We simply lose the enjoyment and the enrichment of them. Paul was certainly a dedicated, spirit-filled man, yet he was suffering as a prisoner. Paul made it clear that physical, material blessings aren't always the experience of a dedicated Christian. Now, I read this story that you know, someone was trying to find this location that they were going to and they didn't, have, they didn't know how to work the GPS and their phones and all that. So all they had was a map, an old map in their glove compartment. And so they took it out, and they were trying to still find this location, but it was an old map, old roads. It was the wrong map. It was just, it wasn't, it wasn't updated. And here's my point with that. People who don't understand God's mystery in his church are trying to make spiritual progress with the wrong map or to change the figure they are trying to build with the wrong blueprints. God's churches on this earth, the local assemblies, including this one, are not supposed to be either Gentile culture cliques or Jewish culture cliques. For an American church to refuse fellowship, with a Mexican church or a Russian church to refuse fellowship with a Ukrainian church. For there to be, for that to be going on, it's just unscriptural. As for a Jewish congregation to refuse a Gentile. God's church. God's church. The, again, the mystery, the, the bride of Christ isn't to be shackled by culture, class, or any other physical distinction. It's a spiritual entity that must submit to the headship of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit. Yes, my friends, yes, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God had a marvelous secret, but God doesn't want it to be a secret anymore. And so if you understand your wonderful, marvelous position in Christ, then live it up. Live it up, my friends, and share it with others. This secret was important to Paul, to the Gentiles, and to the angels. And it ought to be important to you and to me today. Is it important to you? Then go out and share this marvelous secret far and wide. So now I want to speak to those who are seeking forgiveness, are seeking redemption, are seeking to be freed from sin and death. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to do that by leading you to the cross to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to surrender your life to Him. And I want to lead you in a prayer to, to do that if you've never prayed before. So wherever you're at, I'm asking you to just close your eyes, bow your head, and just offer your heart, your undivided heart to him. If, if your heart is broken and shattered, he'll take that. 
He'll take that and he'll heal it, put the pieces together and make it brand new. So wherever you're at, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that couple things, I, I, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit has now made his home in you and he's going to start revealing all these wonderful truths, all these wonderful things that you weren't able to understand or grasp before. And it, he's just going to blow your mind away. Be prepared, prepared for that. But another thing I want you to do is just let us know you prayed that. We want to help you in your next steps if you don't know what to do or where to go. Or if you just need prayer, contact us, let us know. But don't, it doesn't stop there just by saying that prayer. This is, this is a new life. It's a new, wonderful, glorious life that you will now be living. And you're going to have people around you that are going to help you and encourage you. But I hope you were blessed by today's message here in Ephesians chapter 3. Chapter three. Um, and I look forward to, Lord willing, next time as we get into the last half of chapter 3. I hope you have a great week. I love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.